And this is week six of our project, the 1960s project. The 1960s project is reflections of folks who were in high school in the years 1960 to 1969. So these reflections, these tiny thoughts and large memories will provide a recounting, a recalling, a reminiscing, a reflecting and sharing. I want to welcome everyone. I want to thank you for watching. While we have the Facebook Lives, we also have a submission or a blog by our guest. And feel free to look for that link. So that if you want to read more about what's on the guest's mind, you'll have a chance to look at that. Also, you'll be able to share the videos after we finish the Facebook Live and YouTube Live, and we'll also be on Instagram Live simultaneously. So there are tiny thoughts and large memories. Every time I think about my years in high school, I graduated from Germantown High School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1965. So that means I was in high school in 1965, 64, 63, 62. So for those years, uh, early part of the 60s. The class of 65 in literature is known, is known as the infamous class. A lot of literature, a lot of stories, a lot of movies around the class of 65. Our guest today uh, graduated from high school in 1961. As I start these shows, I like to share some facts from that period or some news clips from that period. That was the year that uh, the Soviet Union, Soviet Union sent someone into space, Yuri Gagarin. He was the first person to go into space. And then later that year, the United States launched Alan Shepard into space. So that's when the race for space began. Uh, 61 was also a fateful year because that's when the Berlin Wall uh, was constructed, which divided East and West Berlin. And it was probably what been a decade, 15 years since the wall was removed. And the East and West are still struggling to overcome the challenges of that period where the country and the city were divided uh, by that wall. We hear a lot about Cuba in the news today, particularly in terms of how the current administration wants to embargo or keep people from traveling to Cuba. In 1961 was the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion. And that was an unsuccessful attempt by the United States to overthrow Fidel Castro. And that was an event that has shaped the relationships between Cuba and the United States since then. On a more hopeful note, in 1961, the Peace Corps was established. And that organization went on to do great work in many countries throughout the world. And also the Worldwide Fund for Nature was created. We can see the significance of the nat noun as the we face in the United States periods of fires in the West and hurricanes in the South. So preserving the environment is something that's very important on our top of our lists. When it comes to the African American experience, in 1961 was the what we could call the official launch of the Freedom Rides, 11 members of the Congress of Racial Equality, or known as CORE, boarded buses in Washington, D.C., and headed to various points in the South. And I remember watching some of that on television as the Freedom Riders were attacked at different spots along the way. Uh, there's uh, also the University of Georgia 
admitted its first two African-American students, Hamilton Holmes and Charlene Hunter Galt. Charlene Hunter Galt went on to be a well-known journalist. Now, it was not uh, peaceful because the campus, there was riots on campus because of the resistance to have African-Americans attending the University of Georgia. Some of these issues will be touching on with my guests as we talk about racial progress and affirmative action. In 1961, Motown was founded. So the Detroit sound became popular. Uh, the beginning acts were the Temptations, the Supremes, Stevie Wonder, and also in 61, the Marvelettes released their hit. Please, Mr. Postman, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Postman. Still rings in my head today. The top R&B tune for 1961 was by the Miracles, and that was Shop Around. And many of you may remember that as well. So what I'd like to do is uh, invite my guests and Judith Winston to join me, I'll bring my screen down. Hi, hello, Judy. Hi, how are you? Oh, welcome for joining us. So, Judy, you were in high school, like, wow, I don't know. I can't even count that far back, no. <laughs> 58, 59, 60, and 61. So you, oh. you take us from the 50s into the 60s. Uh, so you, you graduated in what year? I mentioned it earlier, but what year and um, what's I've, you graduated? I've seen... mm -hmm. 61. Okay, 1961, and what, what high school? I don't know whether, Judy, can you hear me? Judy, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, but uh, there was a little interference. I'm not sure it's on my end or yours. Okay, it's the technology, nothing, nothing to sweat about. Whatever happens, happens. Okay. So what, what high school did you graduate from? I graduated from the Philadelphia High School for Girls, Philadelphia, okay. Pennsylvania. All right. And I mentioned that the Temptations got formed in 1961. Was it uh, this year, earlier this year, or latter part of last year? We went to see the Ain't Too Proud to Beg show in Broadway. Do you remember that? It was a year ago last June. Oh, wow. So it's been that long. Yeah, right. we weren't going anywhere this June. Because <laughs> But yeah, do you remember anything about that show? I remember being so excited to hear those tunes. I mean, it was really a, a way of transporting me back to my youth uh, <laughs> because that was one of my favorite uh, groups. Okay. Do you have a favorite song? From them? Um, you know, I was trying to remember um, uh, some of them. I think you mentioned... Uh, Mr. Postman. Oh, that's the Marvelettes. That was that's the Marvelettes. Okay, so um, I do remember going to see the Temptations. I believe they appeared in Philadelphia, in a mm -hmm. at the Uptown Theater, Georgie Woods. Okay, Georgie Woods, the man with the goods. <laughs> right. For those from Philadelphia, he was um, he was a favorite uh, radio disc jockey. Now. I do remember one song uh, that was particularly wonderful in part of my high school years. It was Unchained Melodies. Do you remember that song? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, remember, I remember sitting uh, in the, with my girlfriend um, on Friday evenings. Neither one of us had a boyfriend, so we weren't going out. We'd listen to that song and be very sad. <laughs> yeah, well, pleasant memories and sad memories with some of the tunes, but yeah, so the, I know that the the Temptations uh, ended the the show with um, what becomes of a broke what becomes of the broken hearted. 
So that was that was how they ended the show, sort of capitalize on the, the struggles or the temptations over the many years. What, what did it feel like uh, writing something that happened, writing about something that happened 59 years ago? Well, it, was, it was very um, uh, challenging in some ways to write it down. I have participated in a couple of uh, oral history interviews, but writing it down um, was a challenge, as I said, because I needed to think more clearly about what I wanted to say. It was a long time ago and trying to recall those memories and to describe them in a way that I thought was understandable. Um, was it was uh, a real, um, as I said, challenge. Okay. Uh you start your essay with the day you graduated from high school. You mentioned June 1961. Uh, you you even commented that it was a sunny day. It was. So you when you think about June, whatever day that was in June 1961, what what kind of memories conjure or conjured up in you? Well, I was very excited uh, uh, at the time of my graduation because I knew at that point that I was going to college. Okay. Uh, very curious about it because I had I'd never been to Howard University, which is where I went, and I had no idea what I would find there. In your in your in your submission in your blog, you mentioned that your what, what was your concept of college? Even even you hadn't been to Howard University, but what was your concept of college? I, it was very strange. I used to love musicals, and there were a lot of, uh, not a lot, but several uh, musicals uh, featuring uh, white college students, of course, at college, and there was a lot of singing and dancing on tabletops in, in the um, soda shop or whatever. I mean, I, I never saw anybody in class. <laughs> So were you expecting the same thing when you went to college? I had a feeling that that was not going to be my experience. Um, but, uh, you know, I really, I, as I recall, I didn't really know what to expect, except I was going to college. And that was a dream and a hope that I had for many, many years before then. Well, where did that dream and hope come from? Did, were you? Well, I think probably, I have one aunt who uh, not only went to college, uh, but also ha earned a master's degree. She was the only person that I knew uh, other than teachers who had gone to college. And so I, I knew it was possible for me. I wasn't sure how I would manage to get to college. I mean, I didn't know the process at all. And then, well, what guided you to College. I mean, was were you in a uh, academic program in high school that led yes. you to college? Or? Yes, uh, girls' high school was a college prep high school, and it was a school that one was required to either take a test to get into or get into with um, excellent grades from earlier uh, schooling, junior high school in my case. And so there was um, an expectation uh, in that school that all of us would someday be going to college. I must say, however, that there wasn't, as I recall, that much guidance about just what the process would be. I think it was assumed that many, if not most of the girls came from families whose parents had gone to college. Mine, of course, had not. Okay, your your parents and I. I'm asking these questions like I don't know, but I guess I should let folks know that we that Judy is my sister-in-law. But since I'm the interviewer, <laughs> <laughs> yes, he he's married to my sister Cynthia. Right. So uh, your your parents, Judy, you said that they did not uh, go to college, but did they encourage you to go to college? Um. Yes and no. They were very, both very encouraging to me about my education and getting an education. 
Um, and um, but the, but neither of them either had a sense of um, you know what it what what it was all about. I, I remember very clearly that I had to um, get the information myself about you know how to apply and what the cost would be and um, also how to apply for a loan, uh, which I needed in addition to a scholarship that I uh, managed to win. Before before we talk about college, you, you mentioned in your blog that you, you the title of your of your blog is the making of me, and you mentioned in high school a significant event that caused you to think about who you were. Uh, yes, actually, there were many instances that caused me to think about that, but the one. Uh, I talked about in my uh, blog is um, on the day that um, the, over the loudspeaker in the classroom, we were all in our homeroom classroom, there was an, an announcement that all Negro girls who wanted to meet with the Howard University uh, uh, recruiter should come to a certain room at a certain time. And when that time came, I got up from my seat in my homeroom to uh, to go to the meeting and my my homeroom hmm. I know where are you going I said I'm going to meet the Howard University recruiter so you didn't, before, you, before you go on that there was a pause so you were saying what your name was can you can you repeat that well um she yes she said Miss Mariano my maiden name was Judith Mariano and she called me over and said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to meet with the Howard University recruiter. And she said to me, that is only for Negro girls. And I said to her, I am a Negro girl. And I just remember she, she just started coloring, uh, just turned a bright red because clearly um, she didn't know that. And, so it was, it became clear to me that there were probably a number of my teachers in high school, all of whom were white, that did not know that I was a Negro. Um, and that's my high school graduation picture of my mother, my brother, and my sister. I hope my sister's not watching. She did not like that picture. <laughs> anyway, um, I, uh, so that, you know, that was another indication to me that uh, there was a lot of confusion among some people, none of my black friends, I mean, nobody in the black community, the Negro community, as it was known then, thought that I was anything but <laughs> a Negro girl. Uh, but it was, um, it, it was confusing to me and race, the, co the concept of race and my identity was uh, very much um, confused in my mind uh, until I got to Howard University. You mentioned you had no white teachers at, at Girls High. No but, black teachers, I'm sorry. I'm sorry my, my, my bad, yeah, no, 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 black, no black teachers. But did you know Mary Wright? I did, she came after uh, I graduated. Um, her daughter, her daughter was, uh, in at girls high school at the same time that I was, I think, was her was her daughter Miriam or was the teacher? No, uh, the daughter's Laverne. Laverne, that's great. Laverne Wright uh, was, I think, a junior when I started. Okay. I remember her well because she played the violin in the school orchestra, which is, I I also was in the school orchestra. Okay. Well, Mary Wright taught mathematics at girls high. So she was a black teacher who taught mathematics at Girls High. She's also the wife of uh, Dr. Jeremiah Wright Sr., who is the, obviously the father, father of Jeremiah Wright Jr. So you have that connection. Um, another Wright connection there was that uh, Jeremiah Wright Sr., the husband of Mary Wright, married uh, Cynthia and I. So there's a oh. lot of a lot of right connections going on there. So. And he was a pastor to um, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama when they were in Chicago. Oh, no, the jun junior, junior? The, not junior, the senior one who's married, uh, Cynthia and I. 
Oh, okay. So okay. it was a junior one pastor. To right. We were members of the Grace Baptist Church of Germantown. I and see. Jeremiah Wright Sr. was the pastor, found, I believe it might have been the founding pastor of that, that church. I see. I and, see. and helped that grow. And then, so during that period of growing up, we interacted with uh, Jeremiah Wright Jr. and Laverne. So, because they they were the church family, and we were I see. we were we were the par parishioners. Very interesting, and I didn't know that, or I didn't remember that. Actually, I think I had heard that once. Mm -hmm. so. so, so you get to Howard. How how did you get to Howard? Did you did you fly? Did you take the bus? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not fly. Um, I remember my father put me on the train to go to Washington, D.C. Um, and he, I remember he apologized that he could not afford to send me on, in a parlor car, which I had no idea what that was at the time. So I was on a train and I actually. And can you hear me? Yeah, you, 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 you said you were on a train. For some reason, we had some latency challenges here. With the I see. But you said you were on a train. I was on a train. Uh, I sat next to a young woman who was also on her way to Howard as a freshman. Um, her name was uh, Lillian, at that time, McLean. Um, she's now Lillian Beard. And she told me then that she was going to Howard and that she was going to be going to medical school and become a doctor. And she did. She was a very well-known pediatrician here in Washington, D.C., and uh, I still see her occasionally. And um, so that was that was wonderful. We, <clears throat> the two of us, marched together on the fiftieth reunion of our class. Um, a class at Howard. At Howard University, yes. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. So you you get to you get to Howard University, and it, you, you didn't have any, oh, first of all, you, you mentioned, well, what's, your, what's your friend's name? Her the, name was doctor. Lillian McLean. She lived, she was coming from New York. Right, she, she knew she was gonna be a doctor. What did, you, what did you think you were gonna be? I thought I was going to be a teacher. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's what I had in mind, though I didn't have a really hard fix on that as, a, as my um, vocation, uh, but, you know, I had a seventh grade teacher tell me that I needed to be a teacher. <laughs> I told my mother, actually, that I needed to be a teacher when my mother went to, <laughs> to a PTA meeting and met my seventh grade teacher. Um, my teacher said, oh, Judy says she wants to be a lawyer, but I really don't think that's realistic for a Negro girl to think about becoming a lawyer. I think she should become a teacher. So I decided I would be a teacher. Okay. All right. Well, so you get to Howard. Yes. And, and, all right. So what was it like? You, you get off the train, I guess, at Union Station. And you I, got a, yeah. Yeah. I got off the train um, and uh, there were a group of Howard University students there to meet us because, of course, we had to let uh, the university know when and how we would be arriving. And I was very grateful for that because I had no idea, um, you know, what to do at that point. And the Howard University uh, students helped to direct us to where we could pick up our luggage and our trunk. I had a trunk and two suitcases. I don't remember how we actually got to the campus, um, but uh, we got to the campus and it was so exciting. Uh, we got to what is called the quad, the women's dormitories. And it was and it was and is a very beautiful a set of four buildings that housed uh, women students at Howard. Right, and on Howard, you so you you mentioned in high school you had a some events that forced you or allowed caused you to think about who you were racially. Mm -hmm. Were any events at Howard uh, triggering those thoughts as well? Well, I mean, Howard was a revelation in many, many ways, not only in terms of my education, but there for the first time, I was seeing other black students uh, who, whose parents were college graduates who were professionals. We had, and I was, I had professors, black professors 
who had PhDs, who had written books. I mean, I had never had that experience. I didn't know any black professionals, uh, none. And so I, I began to understand, you know, what was possible for me. And I also began to understand, and this is a, in a sense embarrassing because, um, you know, I, I had always done well in school and I thought I was some sort of special kind of Negro because I didn't see people like me uh, who were black, like my parents and so forth. So to get to that environment and, and see the wealth of experience and talent in that place was just extraordinary. Okay. So what, what was the, what was the, was there an academic opening up or an academic awareness that you gained once you started going to classes? Um, yes. Well, one thing uh, that was very important was that I was um, asked to participate in what was called the honors program. Those of us who had tested uh, quite well on the tests that were given at the beginning of our freshman year at Howard University, um, I became a member of the honors program, which had a very specialized academic um, program uh, in which some of the top professors in the College of Liberal Arts taught. Uh, it also became the opportunity uh, for me to uh, get to know the person who would ultimately become my husband who was in the honors program and who um, was one of the, um, uh, I've forgotten what they called him, one of the monitors, I guess, of the honors room, a library room that we were all able to study in. Okay. And there also, you mentioned you mentioned the fact that you were now around a lot of uh, smart black students, professionals, teachers, and that you 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 weren't you weren't the only one. Yes, I was not, and I should be clear, I was not the only one in my high school either. Most of my friends were black students like me and did very well and and went on to um, have spectacular. Uh, careers. Um, and so I don't want to give the impression that I was the only one, but in terms of my circle of family and, and people outside of school, and I didn't know that much about my black, black friends in, about their background in high school. Mm -hmm. But at Howard University, I just want to say, if I may, that these were uh, African Americans from all over the country. Um, there were many foreign students as well. And again, way outside of my um, experience before then. Okay. So you, you began to engage with people from all over the country, all over the world. And so what did this open up to you in terms of your understanding of American society and your role in, or your place in American society? Well, at Howard University, Jerome, I had the opportunity to learn about race and racism in America. I became uh, very much aware of how I had been miseducated in the Philadelphia public schools uh, that didn't teach us anything really about um, uh, slavery, about reconstruction, about the black codes, about how we as black people um, had come to uh, the situation that we found ourselves in institutional racism, segregation, all of that. And I, I just felt so um, not embarrassed about my lack of, of knowledge, uh, but very sad and, and, and I guess in some ways embarrassed as well that I didn't know hardly anything um, that was um, that, that, that I should have known. I thought I should have known, but I think quite honestly, that was the situation for many of us at that time. Many of us, I mean, well, actually white and black students because obviously the white students were not, um, were not learning any, any of that either. Mm -hmm. So you, you began to get this broad understanding of history 
this broad understanding of what it means to be black in, in the United States. Uh, how, how did that shift your perspective of yourself? Well, um, I think it gave me a, a, a grounding that I did not have before. It also led me ultimately to the career that I have had. Um, I became I was introduced to the civil rights struggle um, in, um, in America. Um, Howard University produced many of the uh, students uh, who were engaged in the uh, civil rights movement, at least they were attending Howard. I remember one of my good friends during my first and second year there was Stokely Carmichael, who um, subsequently became, what was his, he, he changed his name. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I can't recall at this Kwame. moment. Was it, was, it, I, was it Kwame? Did he change it to Kwame? I think so. I think so. I think so. Um, you know, my memory these days is terrible. But uh, so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Kwame Ture. Kwame Ture, right. And, um, you know, he, we were involved in a group called the Little Forum, uh, Stokely Carmichael, um, Cortland Cox, um, who was also very active and we uh, we talked about issues. We talked about current events. We talked about um, uh, race. We talked about civil rights. And I mean, it was like my eyes were just <laughs> expanding as I learned this. And then I started to work for uh, one of the professors um, there who had a contract to work on school desegregation issues, research on school desegregation. Or while you were in undergraduate school? Yes, while I was an undergraduate. Um, and I'd also worked briefly as an undergraduate for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in a very administrative role. I was the, uh, this was 64, 65. Um, the uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act had been passed. And one of the titles, Title VII, had to do with employment discrimination. And it was my job to go down to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission offices and locate cases in which the Legal Defense Fund was involved and to make copies of the complaints to send to the Legal Defense Fund. Okay, well, I'm gonna pause here and see whether any of our guests, I mean, uh, people who are tuned in either on Facebook or or YouTube have any questions, feel free to, if you have any questions for Judy, feel free to post them in the chat box and we'll, we will try to answer them at time permitting. So, yeah. so you, you're, you're getting this deep understanding of, of, of history. You mentioned uh, Kwame Ture, you were talking about the Civil Rights Act of 64, the NAACP, you were beginning to get, how did this relate to your academic studies, if at all? Well, I am, I took a, uh, what would consider then a standard liberal arts uh, curriculum in college. Um, and I was a history major, a political science minor. Uh, so a lot of this um, was a lot of what I learned, uh, particularly in the history uh, department, was related to the place that African Americans had in this country. Again, um, this was not something that I knew about. And um, I was fascinated by it, but also inspired uh, to be active um, in the movement to try to secure equal educational opportunities, particularly but equal opportunity. Um, and, and redress for some of the things that uh, our folks had experienced over the centuries, really. You mentioned that when you were in the seventh grade, you wanted to be a lawyer, and then you mentioned the teacher said you should, uh, your teacher then said you should be a teacher. Now you're in history. So how, how, did, how did you end up with history and political science? Well, I had to select a major, um, and um, I quite honestly was thinking at that time, well, maybe I will be a college professor, having been very impressed with uh, my my professors, and also um, I, I, my my 
I got married after my sophomore year at Howard University. My husband was uh, went into graduate school after graduating from Howard, and he was on his way to being a college professor. And that's Michael Winston. And um, and I think I was really inspired uh, by him. I had been admitted to the graduate program in history at the University of California, where he was and where I spent the first year of our marriage and then an additional two years following my graduation from Howard. Um, and so, so you, you took an interlude and you, you, you went to the West Coast to Berkeley yes. and now you're and you, you re-enrolled in Howard. What was it like re-enrolling? Uh, well, it was very different because I was no longer living on campus. Uh, my husband and I lived uh, in an apartment uh, that we had to, uh, where we had to use public transportation to get back and forth to the campus. He actually was teaching at Howard at this point. He was an assistant professor. And uh, in fact, I had to take a course from him while we were married and he was teaching. That was an experience. Well, we'll save that for another conversation. Yes, indeed. Off air. <laughs> we'll save that for an off air conversation. But uh, I must, I, I, I have to confess, I'm not confess, but I, uh, I, I took a course from Michael Winston as well, Dr. Michael Winston. Uh, and it was a course that was significant in my academic development. I think it was called Modern Revolutions and Liberation Movements. So exactly. We, so it was it was a course that gave me a grounding for a, a lot of my subsequent research and interests. So it was all in the family. <laughs> so, but so you you graduate from Howard, and you what's next? I graduated from Howard. Um, at that point, we were expecting our first child, Lisa. Uh, and she, um, yeah, there I am, I'm pregnant at that time. And uh, uh, so when we went to Berkeley, as I mentioned, I had been admitted to the graduate school, but I decided I needed to put off school until after the baby was born, certainly. And after she was born, I decided I really didn't want to leave her to go into graduate school. So I, um, I was uh, at home with her for the next two years um, and uh, we in Berkeley, California, and uh, we returned to Washington in 1968. Okay. And at what point did you did you go on for additional did you go on for additional education? Um, I did, but some years later, um, I had begun to work at a place called the Council of the Great City Schools, and I was working on, uh, racial desegregation issues with some big city school districts. Um, I was a, started as a research associate and then I came to be the director of the program. Um, at one point uh, in 73, 74, I realized that um, I was working with people who had law degrees, who had PhDs, um, master's degrees, and I felt a little bit as though I needed to get some additional grounding certification. And so that's when I decided to go to law school rather than graduate school. First, because it was only three years and not eight years to complete a PhD and dissertation. <clears throat> I went to law school, Jerome, and in the back of my mind, I think I was hearing my seventh grade teacher saying, you can't be a lawyer. Uh, and I'm thinking, why not? Okay. So you, you become a lawyer. I do. And what, what's your career as a lawyer? Well, um, I discovered that I could easily combine a lot of my interests, including my interest in a lawyer, being a lawyer. So um, I was interested in, in being involved in civil rights, education, and the law. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. And, yeah. so you, and you, all of my, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say all of the positions that I've held as a lawyer uh, once I passed the bar uh, was uh, involved in one or more and usually a combination of those three things, law, education, civil rights. And what kind of positions, what types of positions have you held? Well, um, I have, um, I've been a, a special assistant 
to the director of the Office for Civil Rights in the then HEW. I became an assistant general counsel at the U.S. Department of Education. I also worked uh, as legal counsel and executive assistant to the chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I was an appointee, a political appointee in the Clinton administration for eight years. I was general counsel of the U.S. Department of Education, also served as undersecretary uh, for, uh, and general counsel for part of that time. I was also um, asked to come over to the White House during the Clinton administration to head up his, uh, President Clinton's initiative on race. And uh, that was an interesting and extraordinary experience. Uh, one that I'm glad I did, but I would never, ever, ever go into the White House again to work. It was quite, uh, it was quite a, uh, a tiring experience. I was very, I remember when I finished there to come back to the Department of Education, I said to the uh, Secretary of Education who wanted me to come back, I said, Mr. Secretary, my brain is fried. I don't think I can come back. But he, he encouraged me to take some time and, and to pull myself together, which I did. And uh, I also, um, just to finish this up, I was a uh, law professor at American University for several years before going into the Clinton administration. Um, and when I left the Clinton administration, I opened, uh, uh, established a small law firm with one of my former colleagues, Claudia Wither. So we had a small law firm in which we were providing consultations, advice on employment discrimination and education. Um, uh, affirmative action was the area that I was most involved in. So looking back, if we go back to the title of your blog, The Making of Me, how would you sum up how you were made? Um, I was made, I think, through um, an extraordinary education uh, uh, following um, high school. And I was, it was an education that occurred both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. Uh, um, it was, uh, and, and quite honestly, my, my interest in education is related to my view that that is the pathway, good education, a pathway to uh, realizing our aspirations and being of service. You, you've been involved in struggle for a long time. Uh, when you look at the world today, what, what do you see that's maybe disappointing and what do you see that's encouraging? Well, we've made some progress, but I must say the events of the last several months have made me very sad uh, in understanding how much further we have to go and how much ignorance there continues to be, particularly in the white community, about uh, institutional racism and the place that uh, African Americans have occupied in the the distance that we've come, uh, I think, has not been recognized, and our our abilities uh, have been uh, dismissed in many places, not recognized, and that's sad. Although, although I don't want to discount the amount of progress uh, we've seen and the number of people who have achieved greatness in terms of their positions. I mean, who would have thought, Jerome? when we were in high school that we would once have a black president of the United States. As a, as a closing, what, what advice would you give to somebody who is a freshman in high school? Uh, well, I'm not high school, a freshman in college today. Um, well, as I said, I would, um, although I'm not sure I did say this, I would, I would say to them that it's important for them to understand their capacity, what they can do, and to know that they can achieve great things, uh, that they need to take advantage of all of the educational opportunities that they have, and also seek out people in the community that can share their experiences and help them negotiate 
uh, the path that they uh, want to take to make sure that they are headed in the right direction, um, make sure they understand what resources are important for them to, to have and where they can find those uh, resources because they are out there. We, we can all achieve, I believe, our goals and dreams with the right support and conviction uh, to, to get there. Judy, thank you very much for participating in the 1960s project. Thank you for submitting your blog. I, I enjoyed reading it. I encourage everyone to read it as well. It's, it's posted on the uh, website, What's on Jerome's Mind, and under the 1960s project. So again, thank you very much for participating. Let me say a couple of things to the audience before we sign off. Uh, one, this is, uh, we, we mentioned Howard University, and this week will be a virtual homecoming uh, days at Howard University. And so next Tuesday for the Facebook Live, we will be having a special session. We'll have three people who have participated in the project uh, so far who were in, were in Howard, who went to Howard. They graduated from high school in the 60s but they hit up Howard's, at Howard. So we're gonna have Judy back next week. We're gonna have David Lang, who came from, uh, from St. Louis, Missouri to uh, Howard. He, he arrived in 1966. And then we're gonna have Regina Carson, who is grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, who then ended up at Howard University. So we'll be having an opportunity to talk about the Howard University experience. And I, I should say that I graduated from Howard University. I entered in 1965, uh, and then also had a marital interlude, and I finished in, in 1971. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, share the posts, share the lives, check out the, the, uh, the uh, posting, the, the, um, the essay that Judy submitted. And also I invite you to share your thoughts, your reflections. Those tiny thoughts and those large memories. So, contact us if you'd like to participate in the project. So, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy. And You're welcome.